Section 1. You will hear a young man who wants to find a temporary job talking to someone at an employment agency. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hi, I'm looking for a temporary job. OK, please take a seat. I'll get some details from you and see what we can do. Thank you. OK, so you're looking for temporary work. Would that be full-time or part-time? Well, I'd be happy with either at this point, but I'd prefer full-time rather than part-time, really. OK, well, I'll put you down for that then. Fine. Stephen says that he would prefer full-time work, and the agent says that she will register him for that. So, full-time has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully, and answer questions 1 to 7. Hi, I'm looking for a temporary job. OK, please take a seat. I'll get some details from you and see what we can do. Thank you. OK, so you're looking for temporary work. Would that be full-time or part-time? Well, I'd be happy with either at this point, but I'd prefer full-time rather than part-time, really. OK, well, I'll put you down for that then. Fine. Right, let's get some details from you. First of all, your full name. Stephen Morgan. There are different ways of spelling Stephen. Which one is yours? S-T-E-P-H-E-N. OK, thanks. And your surname is Morgan. So that's M-O-R-G-A-N? Yes, that's right. OK, fine. I'll just need a few more personal details from you and then we can look at the possibilities. So, next then, I need your address and postcode, please. It's 14 Sycamore Avenue. That's S-Y-C-A-M-O-R-E Avenue. And it's number 14, right? Yes, that's right. OK. And the postcode? L M six eight. P. B. OK, I've got that. Next, I'll need a contact number so that we can get in touch with you if and when something suitable comes up. Please say it slowly. 0743897211118 Right, thanks. That's all the personal and contact details. Now, I just need to fill in a couple more sections for our records here. The first one is your current situation. Are you working now? No, I'm a full-time student at university. Ah, OK. What are you studying? I'm in the second year of a three-year degree course in economics. OK, I've made a note of that. Now, I need to get some information about your availability for work. When would you like to start? That sort of thing. OK, well, I'm looking for something from July to September during the long summer holiday from university. If I can, I'd like to work for the whole of that period. OK, fine. The last thing I need from you is what kind of work experience you already have. Just general information on what type of work you've done will be fine. Well, I haven't done much. I've been studying most of the time. But I work for two months as a shop assistant in a sports shop, selling sports equipment and clothing. OK. So, some experience in retail. Anything else? Uh, yes. I worked in a restaurant for three months. OK. And some experience in catering. What did you do there? Well, they actually employed me as a kitchen assistant. But when I got there, they needed another waiter, as they were a bit short of them. So, that's what I did. OK. I've got all that. 
and straight away I think there are two or three vacancies that might suit you. One second. That sounds good. I'll make a note of them. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Right. First of all, there's a cafe in the town centre that's looking for an extra assistant for the busy summer period. That might work for you. There might be some evening work involved in that. They work a shift system there as they stay open in the evening. OK. That sounds possible. Well, they're holding interviews for that next week, so I could fix that up for you. Great. Thank you. OK. I'll let you know about interview dates and times once I hear back from them. Fine. Thanks. Also, the Tourist Information Office is looking for people to do administrative work. It doesn't involve giving any advice to the public. It's in an office behind the scenes there. Would that be of interest? It requires computer skills. That's not a problem. Yes, I'd be really interested in that. OK. I'll email them your details. What else have we got? OK, finally, the new department store is looking for temporary staff over the summer period. At the moment, they're looking for people to work in the electronic goods department, serving customers. Interested? Uh, yes, that's another possibility, I guess. OK, I'll email them your details too. So, we've got a few possibilities, and I'll get in touch with you when I hear something back from them. That's great. Thanks very much. I'll wait for your call then. That's the end of section one. You'll have 30 seconds to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. You will hear a teacher talking to parents at the beginning of a parents' evening at a school. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 15. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the school. It's great to see so many of you here. My name's Jackie Payne, and I'm the Year 7 coordinator and organiser of the Parents' Evening. As you know, we hold this event every year for parents of new children who've just started. OK. I'm going to kick things off by telling you something about the schedule for the evening. So, starting in a few minutes at 7, Mrs Forrester, the head teacher, who of course many of you have already met, will be telling you all about things that will be happening at the school over the course of your children's first year here. She'll explain about the tests that they'll take during the year and how students are divided into different classes for various subjects. She'll also be giving you general information about the school, such as the most recent exam results that our students have achieved, as well as telling you about certain important dates during the school year. At 7.30, the deputy head teacher, Mr Francis, who again, many of you have met, We'll talk about some of the ways in which the school is run and give you some information about recent changes to
to the way things are organised. For example, we've just introduced different arrangements for lunch times so that we can avoid overcrowding and make it easier for everyone to eat their meals without having to wait too long. He'll also give you details of our new guidelines and policies concerning behaviour. This is generally very good at this school, but we've decided to introduce a few new rules to deal with one or two issues that have come up recently. The final talk, from 7.45 to 8, will be given by a current student at the school, and she'll be telling you about some aspects of daily life here from the point of view of someone attending it. She'll also talk about the school trips that happen every year, specifically about the ones that your own children will be going on. And she'll be showing you how your children will use certain websites a bit later in their first year. These are connected with doing homework and with research for projects they'll be doing in their lessons. So we feel it's a good idea for you to find out how these work so that you can help your children to navigate their way around and also for your own information, of course. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. OK. When the talks are finished, there'll be various things that you can do and people you can meet around this area of the school. Here in the main hall, in the far left-hand corner, as you look behind you, there are teachers from the music department who'll tell you all about what they've been doing in that department and you can find out about instruments your children can learn and concerts they can take part in. In the opposite corner, you'll find information about our healthy eating scheme with details of the meals and snacks that we provide. As you leave the main hall through the doors at the back, on your right, when you're outside the hall, you'll find a variety of refreshments and while you're there, you'll be able to chat to other parents. If you continue along that area of the school, on your left, you'll find a number of notice boards with all sorts of displays about what's going on at the school, future events, and lots of interesting news and information to look at. At the far end of that area, you'll find a reception desk where you can get information and ask questions about the administrative aspects of the school and get to know the staff that you're in touch with when you contact the school by phone or email. For example, to report that your child is ill and can't come to school. There, you can also register your interest in volunteering to help at the school, perhaps with the organisation of events to raise money through the Parents' Association. And you can have a chat with Helen Graham, who runs that. She'll be very happy to welcome any new volunteers. If you turn left before you get to the reception desk, you'll be going into the corridor where the majority of the teaching staff will be waiting to greet you and answer questions about their subjects. On the left of that corridor, you'll find maths, science and IT in that order. And on the right, you'll find languages, history and geography and art, again in that order. And at the far end of that corridor, the head teacher and various senior members of staff will be waiting to discuss any issues you may want to raise or any queries you may have. OK? Well, that's more than enough from me. I'd now like to ask Mrs Forrester, our head teacher, to tell you... That is the end of section 2. You will now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 3. You will hear two students, Liam and Holly, discussing an assignment they are doing which involves studying the history of a particular British national newspaper. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 24. So, how are you getting on with the newspaper assignment, Holly? Yeah, pretty well. I think I've done all my research and I'm just about ready to write it up. How about you? Yes, same as you. Must say, I found it fascinating. There were lots of things I hadn't expected. <laughs> That's true. I mean, for example, the sales figures. It's hard to imagine now just how many people bought the paper a few decades ago. Amazing, isn't it? But then, of course, there weren't all the other news sources back in those days. I know, but even so, the figures are incredibly high. Way beyond what I would have thought, too. And, of course, it's very interesting to compare them with the sales since the arrival of the Internet. Yeah, the way they responded to that. Putting the paper online free of charge was, I guess, something that couldn't be avoided. Every other paper was doing it. But the paper came to regret it, and probably still does, because that decision had such a negative financial impact. I find it hard to believe that they didn't at least try to charge for it online from the start. Hmm, I can see why they did it in the context of the time. One aspect that did strike me as extraordinary was finding out how influential that paper has been over the ages. It seems to have played a significant role in shaping government policy on occasions. Yes, and social attitudes too. I hadn't realised that a single paper could have so much influence. Really? I think you'll find that it still does. It's always been the paper read by what they call opinion formers and people in high places, so that was what I expected to find. What did you make of its coverage of those major historical events we looked at? That was fascinating, to read about such huge events as they were reported at the time when they happened. It was great to read contemporary accounts of things that are now part of history. Yeah, I really enjoyed doing that too seeing how reporters at the time described these things that we all know about. One other thing that struck me was how interesting it was to look at the cartoons. Yes, I think so too. I was actually shocked by some of them. I hadn't realised how satirical and critical they could be. They showed public figures in ways that I don't think you'd be allowed to today. I don't know about that. I felt that they weren't so different in tone from a lot of the cartoons in the paper today. Before you hear the next part of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 27. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 27. OK, so that brings us to the section of our report that has to cover major changes in the paper over the last few decades. Yes, well, its politics can't be said to have changed much. In my view, it's been pretty consistent in that area all the time. Right. Although the issues have changed, its general position has remained the same. I found its coverage of famous people interesting, the way it hasn't really got involved in the so-called celebrity culture that's grown over the last few decades. It certainly hasn't jumped on that bandwagon, hasn't dumbed down, as they say. But sport, for example, is a whole different matter. That used to be just a relatively small section, and now it's a massive part of the paper. And its approach isn't the same either. Hmm. Instead of dry match reports and articles as it used to have, it moved into a lot more interviews and opinion pieces. Yes, I spotted that. It was also interesting to look at its handling of social issues. 
It has a strong reputation for that today, but in fact, it was always an important feature that distinguished it from other papers. Yeah, it was campaigning on social issues just as much then as it does now. Of course, one major feature we shouldn't ignore is the way it looks. <laughs> Definitely, it's unrecognizable today compared with how it looked even twenty years ago. Very noticeable. Everything about it. Size, layout, even the design of the name at the top. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-eight to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-eight to thirty. Okay, so now we need to have a general section about British newspapers over the last few decades. What are you planning to say in that? I'm going to focus on the way a lot of British people form their opinions of other people on the basis of which newspaper they read. It's one of the ingredients that makes people decide what sort of person someone is. It's a very British thing that, and I'm going to write about the assumptions that people make of the readers of various papers. That's really interesting. Nice idea. I'm going to look at the issue of loyalty to a particular paper. I'm going to look at why people might change from reading one paper to another as they get older, whether price changes have any significant impact on sales, that sort of thing. It seems to me that the key point here is that while some people stick with the same paper all their adult lives, others change the paper they read as their own lives change. So I'm going to look at the kind of life changes that result in a change of paper. That's a really good idea. Wish I'd thought of it. Anyway, it's been enjoyable doing this project, hasn't it?、Mm. I think it was great that the main focus was on one particular paper rather than all of them, which would have been too big a topic to tackle for the whole project. Yes, it meant we could look at one thing in depth rather than just a superficial view of a lot of them. It's one of the better things we've done on the course. <laughs> Definitely. That is the end of section three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. You will hear a lecturer at Tower Bridge in London. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-four. Now listen and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-four. Tower Bridge is, of course, one of the best-known landmarks in London today. When it was built, it was actually one of many great engineering achievements in Britain in the nineteenth century, a period when all sorts of inventions and innovations were being made to modernise the country and to solve particular problems of the day. In this case, the problem was how to provide another way of crossing the River Thames in that area of the river, the East End of the city. That part of London had become a very busy port, and it was densely populated. The nearest bridge at the time was London Bridge to the west of the port area. To provide a way of crossing the river in this part of the city, 
Tower Subway was built in 1870. This contained an underground railway, one of the world's first, but it didn't last for long. After three months, it closed and Tower Subway was then reopened as a pedestrian tunnel, with users paying a toll to walk through it. Public demand for another crossing to be built grew, as it was taking both pedestrians and vehicles a long time to cross the river. The sheer volume of traffic and people was so great that people were delayed for hours when trying to use the available crossings. Eventually, in 1876, the Special Bridge or Subway Committee was formed to produce the solution, and a public competition was set up to choose the best design. Over 50 entries and a considerable amount of controversy over which to select, until in 1818 a design submitted by Horace Jones, the city architect, was chosen. Construction began in 1886 and it involved five major contractors and 432 construction workers until the bridge was finally completed and opened eight years later. In 1894. The key issue when it came to the design of the bridge was that it wasn't possible to build a traditional fixed bridge in that location as such a bridge would have prevented ships with tall masts from gaining access to the port facilities in that part of the river. So a type of bridge called a bascule bridge was devised. This involved two towers built on piers in the centre of the bridge with two equal bascules between them. These bascules were pieces that could be raised and separated from each other so that ships could pass through the bridge. On each side of the towers, piers and bascules, there were two suspension bridges. Between the central towers were high-level walkways for the use of pedestrians when the bridge was open. Before you hear the next part of the lecture, you have some time to look at questions 35 to 37. Now listen and answer questions 35 to 37. Right, now let's have a detailed look at how the bridge was raised for ships to pass through it. This is a slide showing a diagram of the bridge. And here, you can see at the far end of the south side of it, are the original engine rooms, which you can visit today if you take a tour of the bridge. In here, there was a boiler which was powered by coal. This boiler produced steam, which powered two big engines. And these engines produced pressurised water, which was stored in six containers called accumulators. This was sent via pipes to some more accumulators in each of the two piers in the central section of the bridge. When it was time to open the bridge, the bridge operator, situated at the bottom of the tower on the south side, pulled a set of levers to set in motion the opening of the bascules. This action started engines in each of the two piers, each of them operating one of the two bascules. Gears attached to these two engines, which were called the driving engines, would then turn, causing the bascules to rise and open. The bascules rose to an angle of 86 degrees, providing enough room for ships to get through the central part of the bridge. Although the process was quite complex, it actually took only about a minute for the bascules to rise to their maximum height. Before you hear the rest of the lecture, you have some time to look at questions 38 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 38 to 40.
A number of rules were used for controlling the passage of ships through the bridge at different times. In the daytime, red flags were used to signal to ships, and these were placed on both bridge piers. At night, coloured lights were used. Red to show that the bridge was closed, and green to show that it was open. Ships going through the bridge also had to display signals. In the daytime, they had to display a black ball high up in the ship, and at night, they had to have red lights in the same place. Well, the bridge today is much the same as it was when it was first built, but the process for raising the bascules has changed quite a lot. The bascules are still operated by hydraulic power, but the engines are now driven by oil and electricity, not steam. And the bridge operator now works in a different location, in the control cabin in the north tower of the bridge. The system of signals is no longer used, and today ships have to give 24 hours notice that they will require the bridge to be opened. That is the end of section 4. Now you have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test.